Thank you for joining us. I'm Gord Long with the Financial Repression Authority. Today I have Richard Duncan joining us from Thailand. Thailand. Uh, Richard's an internationally respected expert in finance with a, a, a career that inc includes many, many high-profile corporations around the world. Welcome, Richard. Hi, Gord. Thanks for having me on the show. Richard, I was about to go in and naming some of the places you've been with, IMF, World Bank, uh, ABM, AMRO, but I thought maybe I should, we should start because we have so many new listeners uh, that may not be familiar with your background, the things you've, you've been involved with. Okay. Well, so I moved to Asia. And I started my career in Asia in 1986 as a securities analyst in Hong Kong. And I've worked in the securities industry on the buy side and the sell side most of the time since then and most of the time in Asia, moving around between Hong Kong and Singapore and Thailand several times. But I've also worked for the World Bank in Washington, D.C. for a couple of years, and I was the head of global investment strategy for ABN AMRO Asset Management in London for a couple of years. And along the way, I've written three books. The most well-known was The Dollar Crisis, Causes, Consequences, and Cures, uh, which described why the U.S. trade deficit and flaws in the post Bretton Woods international monetary system would inevitably lead to a severe global economic crisis. So that, that's, that's my background. Richard, we're going to talk about China today um, because you put out uh, one of the things you do, you didn't mention, is you publish Macro Watch, a must reading a must subscription for anybody that seriously wants to watch the uh, global macro environment. But you put out a series, three, three different uh, tapes, videos with outstanding slides on China. And I understand you're going to have a fourth that's coming out. But I really wanted to focus on China. And you brought some great slides as a, a, from that set. But what made you, what, what made you do, do such a heavy emphasis on China? Because you don't typically do a three-set uh, series. Well, just a, a word first, then on, on MacroWatch. That is what I do now. I mean, writing books is, is great. It was a great experience. I hope to write and publish some more books going ahead. But it takes a year to write a book, and then the publisher takes at least six months to, to publish the thing and get it in the bookstores. So what I'm doing now is MacroWatch. And MacroWatch is a video newsletter. I upload a new video every couple of weeks and sell this on a subscription basis. And so this is so much more timely than writing books. So this has been going on now for about two and a half years. Um, I have 25 hours worth of MacroWatch videos in the archives. And as I said, a, a new one is uploaded every couple of weeks. So recently I've been doing a series on China. Uh, China's in the headlines. Everyone now realizes that China's really already started to have a hard landing. So I've done now four uh, videos, MacroWatch videos, that have three have been uploaded, one's about to be uploaded next week, on uh, explaining this economic crisis in China, how it came about, what's happening, and what's likely to happen next. Yeah, the, uh, the, the, the MacroWatch series is, is must, as I said, must following for anybody that's serious. But I think it's worth the price of the script, subscription myself just for your liquidity gauge and your analysis on, on liquidity flows and flows that are happening, which impact markets. And in that, we're not going to talk about that today, uh, but that in itself is, is worth the price of admission, if you would. Uh, Richard, you brought some slides. Let's just jump right into them. And, and, I, and I know that they're just a subset of, of the of, of what the analysis you have, but I want to I want to give our listeners just some basic understandings of what's going on in China and what they should be paying attention to, and and, and we're going to start with this this imbalance, this excess surplus that we have in China, be the difference between production and consumption. Right, China's economy is absolutely wildly unbalanced. They have invested so much more than they consume every year, and in the past they were able to export this excess production into the global economy, primarily to the U.S. But now the U.S. economy is so weak and the global economy is so weak that the rest of the world just can't continue absorbing more and more Chinese exports every year. And so between that, the weak global demand, and 
the fact that the rest of the world is already saturated with Chinese goods, between that and the fact that uh, per capita income in China itself is just so low that the Chinese can't afford to buy all the things that China produces, well, China is now stuck with an extraordinary glut. It has excess capacity across every industry on just a mind-boggling scale. And it's very, they're really facing, let's put it mildly, very grave challenges as to how they can manage their economy now going forward. So just in this first chart, to, to, to begin with, what this shows is investment in China. Now, that doesn't mean other people investing in China. It means how much money is invested in all kinds of um, gross fixed capital formation. What that means is not only investment in building new factories, but investment in housing, uh, office buildings, uh, residential buildings, uh, commercial buildings, all kinds of investment, gross fixed capital formation. Well, you can see that it's expanded 50 times between 1990 and 2014. So just extraordinary explosion of investment. Um, that, and that has been the, the real fuel behind China's economy. You could say China has followed a, a development strategy based on export-led and investment-driven growth. Well, so here you see the 50-fold expansion of the investment-driven growth. And I'm, not, I'm looking at this, the things, examples of, this, of the investment where it's went into, cement production, for example. That's right. Uh, so the next chart, we have cement production. You can see that it has increased by 12 times between 1990 and 2014. And by the way, just in three years alone, between 2011 and 2013, China produced as much cement as the United States did during the entire 20th century. Now, that, that is really quite incredible. But think about that. That means if over the next three years, if China again produces the same amount of cement, that will be, of course, again, as much as the U.S. did in the entire 20th century, and the same for the following three years, and the same for the following three years. But that would represent no growth whatsoever for China. That would just be zero growth in the cement industry. So it just gives you some idea of how much excess capacity in production they're drowning in. And by the way, they now have 59% of global cement capacity. And the next chart is on steel. It's a similar story, a 12-fold increase between 1990 and 2014. And they now have 50% of global steel production capacity. The problem is the world doesn't need that much global steel production capacity. The capacity utilization for the world is only 65%. That means 35% of all existing capacity for steel in the world is going unused. And so that's why it's pointless for China to build any more steel capacity because they can't sell the steel they're making already. But if they don't continue investing, then they're not going to have economic growth. And, that, and, and, and they're not only economic growth, but job creation. And with 1.3 billion people, and a lot of them still moving from the rural to the urban centers looking for jobs, they expect the government to create jobs. So now you've got this artificially high run rate and the jobs associated with any kind of slowing could mean layoffs, but it also means lack of job growth. And, and that's what they hold the government accountable to. Is, am I correct in that? You are right. And I mean, to put this into a fairer perspective, China's main goal for the last several decades has been to create jobs through this investment-driven and export-led growth. And they have succeeded brilliantly in doing that. Uh, they have created 390 million jobs uh, in the last, between 1980 and 2015. So this is, they've had a population explosion. The population has more than doubled in China during my lifetime. They had to find these people jobs, and they have. So the strategies worked out brilliantly, really up until the time that the U.S. economy went into crisis in 2008. So long as the U.S. current account deficit continued to grow larger and larger every year, that was 
great for but, the U.S. But it hasn't. It, it's been. Sh it's actually. It's. We have still have a deficit, but it's been. Sh the deficit's been shrinking. So by Triffin's paradox, it's. It's actually starting to strangle China because of this lack of extra funds coming in. Right? Is that a fair assumption? That's right. So starting in. Up until 1980 or so, the U.S. trade was in balance. Under the Bretton Woods system, trade had to balance. It was only after 1980 that the U.S. started running these very large trade and current account deficits. And by, 19, by 2006, the current account deficit had grown all the way out to $800 billion that one year alone. So you could call that the, the international monetary system that, that followed the breakdown of the Bretton Woods system, no one really gave it a name, but I think it's properly called the dollar standard. So as long as the current account deficit of the U.S. was growing, then the global economy boomed. So that was the dollar standard boom. But after 2006, particularly after 2008, the U.S. current account deficit corrected by about half. And so that was the dollar standard bust. And that's when China's troubles really began to uh, be noticeable. They tried to keep their economy growing by allowing bank loans to explode. Uh, since 2009, bank loans have tripled in China. And that resulted in even more investment and even more excess capacity. But now the bank loans are not performing. And non-performing bank loans are essentially destroying the bank deposits within the banks. And they've reached the point now where they, it's, it's, they're really running into a brick wall. If they continue having more and more credit growth, this is just going to exacerbate their problems. The more money they in, lend and invest, at this stage, the more money they lose. So that's the nature of China's crisis at this point. So all these FX currency reserves that they had from a, such a great trade with, with America went into their banking system, three to four trillion dollars. It goes out at reserve ratios at probably 16 and a half, let's say 25 times. That's just been an explosion of credit, built out all of this production. Now you said since 2008 there's been a problem. Now we've had quantitative easing in all sorts of forms in America. Uh, even though the deficit has, deficit has been shrinking in America, we've still been producing all this credit. And how has that impacted China? Because I know, I personally believe that credit wasn't about bringing demands forward, which it did briefly. It's been about this explosion in supply in emerging markets. Nine trillion dollars of extra funding went, in, went into, into those countries, which are big importers or exporters to China or China's imports. And China's imports are huge as are their exports. So this isn't this compounding itself, but I'm, what I'm grappling with is, wouldn't quantitative easing have helped be helping China? Well, I think if you're, the quantitative easing that the Fed has done in the US, they created $3.6 trillion uh, in three rounds. And yes, that dramatically pushed up US asset prices. Right? Household sector net worth has climbed now to something like $85 trillion, which is 60% above where it was in 2009. And that, so that created a tremendous wealth effect that did stimulate consumption in the US and that did, did pull in more imports than would have come in otherwise, allowing China to sell more exports than it would have been able to do otherwise. Um, but still, even with the quantitative easing, that hasn't been enough to allow China's economy to keep growing, because China's economy is now so large, it's, it's roughly 65% the size of the U.S. economy now. And we're talking about such large numbers, it's very, very difficult to make it continue growing by 6 or 7% a year, which is what the Chinese authorities would like to do. And you can see some of the slowdown in some of these other charts that, I've, that we have one showing the household consumption in China, the growth rates of household consumption versus the household uh, versus the growth rates of investment in China. Well, investment has grown at a 17% a year on average from 1990 to 2014, but consumption has only grown by 13% a year on average. So consequently, you have this 
extraordinary gap that's formed between how much China produces and how much it consumes. Just in the years between 2005 and 2014, China invested $4.6 trillion more than it consumed. And in one year alone, 2012, 2013 actually, it, they invested $900 billion more than they consumed. So again, in the past they were able to export all this excess production, but now the global economy is too weak to allow them to keep doing that. And it's also interesting to look at more details on credit growth versus China's GDP growth. Now, the, one of the broader measures of credit growth in China is called aggregate financing. That includes bank loans and corporate bonds and, uh, and, and a number of other cre credit measures. So that's one of the most referred to measures of credit in China, aggregate financing. Well, in this chart, you can see that aggregate financing, which is the blue bar, has been slowing quite significantly from extremely high rates. In 2009, aggregate financing in that one year increased by 35%, trying to stimulate China's economy during the worst part of the global recession, it's great recession. But since 2009, the credit growth has been slowing very significantly. And last year, it grew by 12.6%, which is still a high number. But you can notice as credit growth slowed, so did nominal GDP growth. And last year, nominal GDP growth grew by only 6.4%, so roughly half as much as aggregate financing. So one of the things that I focus on in macro watch is, is credit growth, because I believe in this new world of fiat money that credit growth drives economic growth. And that's true not only in the United States, but in China and elsewhere, too. So what you can see in this chart is as credit growth has slowed down, so has the nominal GDP growth. Now, this is even more alarming because the, the in absolute numbers, aggregate financing is twice as large as the GDP. And you can, you can see that in the next chart. The, the absolute level of the growth in aggregate financing last year was 15 trillion yuan. And with 15 trillion yuan worth of new credit, they were only able to achieve 4 trillion yuan worth of GDP growth. So it took almost four, you could say four dollars worth of credit to generate one dollar's worth of GDP growth. So it's not, it takes more and more credit to generate GDP growth in China. It's showing us that the credit is increasingly misallocated and wasted. Wait, Richard, a big part of uh, China's GDP is, is investment. It's capital formation coming into the country. And we're, we're witnessing or at least the perception is, is tremendous capital leaving China right now. How, how is that impacting its ability to sustain credit growth when you've got a capital, I could say, a capital flight going on? Well, yeah, very interesting question. Let me show you one other chart first before I answer that to just put, it, put this clearly into perspective how much credit growth we're talking about. And this is the one that shows credit growth in the U.S. versus credit growth in China. Now, we have... U.S. credit growth is shown in the blue bar, and these are all in billions of U.S. dollars. And China's credit growth is shown in the red bar. And the numbers are actual up to 2015. But after 2015, then I extrapolate out credit growth in China based on last year's rate of credit growth, which was 12.6% per year. So it's, it's amazing. For the last seven years now, credit growth in China has been more than credit growth in the United States, even though the U.S. economy is still much larger than China's economy. And notice that if credit growth in China continues to grow at this last year's rate of 12.6%, then by the year 2021, total credit growth in China that year will be more than the peak level of credit growth 
in the United States in 2007, the year leading up to the, the, great, the great bubble. That was the peak of the U.S. bubble. And we know how that ended in the United States. And it certainly wouldn't end any better in China, where income is so much lower that it makes it much less easy for China to manage such a high level of debt. So China's, China's facing very serious challenges on a number of fronts. And first of all, it's not going to be easy to fund this kind of credit growth. And secondly, even if they can fund it, then it's certainly not going to be possible to invest that money profitably. And it will just result in a higher level of non-performing loans, which will destroy more and more bank deposits. Now, up until last year, the, the real origin of the money that funded China's great economic boom, it came from China's current account surplus, their trade surplus. Plus, they also had a surplus on their financial account, money coming in, for instance, to build factories. And up in between 1990 and 2014, that in total was four trillion US dollars. And that went into China's banks and through the miracle of fractional reserve banking and the money multiplier, that grew to $20 trillion worth of credit expansion during that period. Looking ahead though, things are going to become more difficult because in 2015, China experienced a half a trillion dollars of capital flight. A half a trillion dollars left China on their financial account. And this happened because of fears that the Chinese authorities were going to devalue the currency, which they did on a small scale in August. So once it became clear that the Chinese currency was no longer going to continue appreciating every year, and that it was probably going to begin depreciating, everyone tried to get their money out of China all at one time. So the money that had been going in, the money flows that had been going in and financing the great China boom, well, they, they reversed. And so that tightened liquidity conditions in China, and it will make things more difficult for the Chinese to fund the extraordinarily large amounts of credit that they need to keep the economy growing. If they were to devalue the yuan, and there's certainly a lot of sense that that is in the works, uh, wouldn't that bring in new capital investment? Um, because money would be cheaper, bigger dollars coming into a smaller currency and help investment? Or is that going to just, the, even the rumors of it, stimulate more capital flight? Well, so if they had one big one-off devaluation, 20 percent, then that would make China much more competitive in the global economy. So their trade surplus would, would grow sharply, and that would bring in more money into China. But of course, China's trading partners would protest very loudly because already China already has a very large trade surplus with the rest of the world. Its overall current account surplus last year was about $300 billion. So to devalue further, simply in order to make that very large current account surplus very much larger would be completely unfair by anyone's standards. And China's trading partners would probably put up trade tariffs because already there's a very loud backlash against free trade around the world. Now, if they just tried to depreciate the currency gradually, then that could cause a different set of problems because people would realize that the currency is going to keep losing value and that would result in more people trying to get their money out while they can before the devaluation occurs. And they would have even more capital flight. So either strategy they adopt is going to cause problems. And if China, to whatever extent that China does devalue gradually or at one large one-off devaluation is going to be very damaging for the rest of the world. Because if China devalues, then China will have less purchasing power. So it will not be able to buy as many things from other countries. 
So the other countries who sell commodities to China, for instance, well, first of all, the commodity prices would drop sharply. And then the currencies of the commodity producing countries like Australia and Brazil, those currencies would lose value. And then the profits of the metal and mining corporations who sell commodities, their profits would take another big hit. And so there'd be another big stock market sell-off. That's why there was such, uh, such such ramifications last August. In August, you know, the, the global um, markets felt it significantly. Right. And uh, now, what, can, Richard? What can we read into? I've noticed the FX, the Federal, the currency reserves, the current account are fall. Uh, uh, currency reserves are falling in in uh, in China. They've been selling U.S. Treasuries, not to an ex a major way, but they certainly have been selling. Maybe more importantly, they're no longer acqui acquiring treasuries. Uh, what should we read into the FS, the currency reserves falling? Yeah, so last year, the foreign exchange reserves, well, well, from the peak, which was sometime in 2014 to now, they have fallen by something like $800 billion to now $3.2 trillion. That's foreign, China's foreign exchange reserves. Um, but I think the more significant thing is that reserves have not been growing, rather than the fact that they have been shrinking. Let me explain. So when China's foreign exchange reserves go up, that is because more money is going into China than is leaving China. And that would tend to put upward pressure on, Chinese, on the Chinese currency. In order to prevent the upward pressure on the currency, the Central Bank of China, the PBOC, prints money from thin air and buys those foreign currencies, primarily dollars, at a fixed or near fixed exchange rate. And so they accumulate foreign reserves that way. And as they accumulate more and more foreign exchange reserves, they need to invest those reserves in, a, in so if they accumulate dollars, which is the main currency they accumulate, then they need to invest those new dollar reserves back into U.S. dollar-denominated assets, like treasury bonds. And so that puts upward pressure on the treasury bonds and puts downward pressure on the yields. And it generally gives a, a boost to the, to the financial markets in the United States. So that's when foreign exchange reserves are increasing. But I don't think it's as negative when they decrease. It's just not, it's just not positive, but it's not, it's not symmetrically negative because China central bank has to sell foreign exchange reserves, but someone else, so they may have to sell their treasury bonds. When, when the foreign exchange reserves go down, they're selling treasury bonds, but someone else is buying those treasury bonds. Uh, so for example, last year, I, as I mentioned, it was four or five hundred billion dollars leaving China on their financial account. Those people wanted to sell their Chinese yuan and buy dollars. So that's what they did. They sold yuan and bought dollars. But then those people had dollars. So they needed to buy U.S. dollar denominated assets like treasury bonds, like the treasury bonds that the PBOC was selling when its foreign exchange reserves were falling. So that's a bit complicated, but the PBOC was selling the bonds, but someone else selling yuan wanted to buy those bonds because they were selling yuan and buying dollars. We've noticed what, Richard, what I've noticed is the, the buyers who are absorbing those uh, sell, uh, bonds that are being sold, treasuries being sold, are really people fleeing negative interest rates. They've got $10.4 trillion worth of bonds outstanding around the world that are at negative interest rates, primarily Europe. And rather than take a negative yield, they'll, they'll, they'd rather buy U.S. Treasuries, even at pathetic 1.7, 1.8 on the 10-year, um, because the currency has been relatively stable. They've been, they've been uh, actually making money on the currency, too, because the U.S. dollar has been going up because of the money coming in. So it kind of catches. So I think that's, in the short term, offset that. But I'm not well, sure how sustainable that's going to be. If, if, if China has to continue to sell its FX reserves and how much money that time that money will keep coming in, especially with the U.S. having to increase its debt levels. 
and the amount that's rolling over. Well, what you said is, is, is absolutely correct, but do keep in mind that when the reason China's foreign exchange reserves are falling is because Chinese people want to sell Chinese yuan and buy dollars. And so when they do that, they have dollars, and with those dollars, they want to buy treasury bonds. So the PBLC is selling treasury bonds, but there are also a lot of Chinese people now who have a lot of dollars that they didn't have before who want to buy treasury bonds. And they can do that. They can buy it. There's no capital restrictions of leaving it. They can transact those uh, those purchases right now without any restrictions. Well, it's very hard to say what you can do and what you can't do in China. It depends on who you are and who you know. Okay. <laughs> so it's, uh, uh, but should, could we expect capital controls in the future? Well, China already has capital controls. I meant more aggressive. I, exactly. I mean, there, I, we got pictures here of people leaving with 70,000 American dollars strapped around their waists, uh, and they're being arrested at the airport and, and searched because of this capital fight. But I meant more intense capital controls. Well, it's not those people with the 70,000. It's 70 billion. <laughs> the problem is, is these large state-owned enterprises and the the four, just say the four largest Chinese banks, which are the four largest banks in the world now, they can move money around in mysterious ways that the government uh, either can't control or chooses not to control. Because after all, the government controls the state-owned enterprises and the largest banks, controls them and owns them. Richard, do you, do you think there's a devaluation in the yuan coming? It looks like there will be a steady depreciation. A steady depreciation versus a one of and it's done. I would guess it's going to have to be more of a steady depreciation. You know, much of it depends on what happens to the dollar. Uh, the whole point of the little devaluation in August, in, in my view, they, the PBOC, the central bank, devalued by about 3%. Well, that was a very clear warning to the Fed that if the Fed continued hiking or at that point, the Fed was talking about hiking interest rates. They hadn't started yet. If the Fed had hiked in a series of interest rate hikes, then, of course, the dollar would have continued to appreciate. And because the Chinese currency is roughly pegged to the U.S. dollar, that would have made the Chinese currency continue to appreciate as well. So that little devaluation was the PBOC telling the Fed very clearly that if you hike, we're going to devalue. And so the Fed didn't hike in September as it had intended to. They eventually did hike a little bit in December, but since then they haven't hiked again. But isn't, that, isn't Richard, isn't that exactly what we've seen in the month of May? Since May 1st, uh, Bullard has said, you know, we're talking about we're going to have a, a rate increases coming maybe June, July, up until we had a bad labor number here and suddenly came off the table. But during that period of time, when Yellen and them were all talking, China devalued four times in the month of May. Minor, not, but they were like shots across the bow once again to, to America saying, do not increase the rates and drive the dollar up. Am I reading more into those rates? Are those? No, it's very clear. If the dollar goes up, the yuan is going to go down. And, and that, that, that's a problem because the more the yuan goes down, the cheaper Chinese goods will become in the United States. And that will increase deflationary pressures in the United States, making it more difficult for the Fed to achieve its mandate of 2% inflation. So this is really, uh, this is, this is uh, something that the PBOC is holding over the Fed to some extent uh, to prevent them from hiking rates. But of course, the U.S. economy is far too weak. The Fed shouldn't be hiking rates anyway. Uh, the GDP in the first quarter was only up 0.8%. Uh, things are deteriorating pretty rapidly. And if no, in normal circumstances, these would be the sort of circumstances we'd see the Fed cutting interest rates rather than hiking them. You would think so, wouldn't you? We, we, we think so. <laughs> it, went, it makes no sense uh, it, it, on the surface. So there's other strategies going on. Richard, we're running out of time, but I, I'd like to go back to how we started, and that is the job the the job creation in China and the absolute requirement to sustain jobs. You can't keep building ghost cities and and uh, ghost malls, et cetera, to sustain it. What do you think China is going to be? Do we have social unrest coming in China? 
And what do you think the government's going to do to sustain this job growth? Well, there's, there's a chart I'd like to show you. It's China's share of the world GDP, investment, and household consumption expenditure. So in, in green, what the, the green line shows you that as of 2014, China's share of China's economy, its share of global GDP, China's economy made up 13% of the global economy. But Chinese investment, sorry, Chinese consumption, household consumption, it made up only 9% of the world's total consumption. On the other hand, Chinese investment made up 24.4% of all the world investment. So almost a quarter of all the investment occurring in the world occurred in China uh, in 2014. Now, that is mind-boggling because, again, investment is not just investment in building factories, but investment includes building all kinds of structures, residential structures, office buildings, commercial buildings, and industrial buildings. So, so already China's investment is a quarter of world investment. Now, if they continue growing at these sorts of, at the kind of growth rates that they have for the last two decades, then within 10 years, the le if China's growth rate of investment continues at the same rate, and the world growth rate of investment continues at the same rate, within 10 years, Chinese investment will make up 60% of world investment. So clearly, that's just not possible. That's not going to happen. So the investment's going to have to slow. And what the Chinese policymakers tell us is that they're going to move from a strategy, a growth strategy, they're going to move from investment-driven growth to consumption-driven growth. But that's just not possible. Because if you begin laying off people who work in steel factories, then those people aren't going to consume more, they're going to consume less. The reason consumption has been growing in China as much as it has is because investment has grown so much. Now, you may lay off a Chinese steel manufacturing worker, and that worker may find a job in the services industry. But as we know from the U.S. experience, Wages in the services industry, it, wages there are much lower than in the manufacturing industry. So that's not going to boost consumption. So if, if they begin, if investment grows, if investment slows, as it must, then consumption is also going to slow. So what that means going forward is, well, first of all, China's economy is going to continue slowing significantly. But in order to have any growth at all, Chinese government spending is going to have to increase sharply, just as it did in Japan after Japan's great economic bubble popped in 1990. The only way Japan has managed to avoid collapsing into a Great Depression for the last 26 years is they've had very, very large budget deficits, 6 to 8% of GDP almost every year for the last 26 years. So Japanese government debt has increased from 60% of GDP in 1990 up to 250% of GDP now. So we're going to see something quite similar in China. Chinese government debt is going to have to rise very sharply to keep China's economy from collapsing into a very severe recession slash depression. Now, in my opinion, China's hard landing has, has already begun. After decades of having very rapid growth in industry after industry, double-digit growth rates. There's a, and there's a chart on this China's hard landing has already begun. You can see that all of that changed in, in 2015. Instead of growing at annual rates of 10 to 20 percent a year, suddenly industries like steel production, cement production, rail freight, and building under construction, those were all negative. In other words, they, they were already in recession. Now, so China announced that their economy grew last year by 6.7%. In nominal terms, it grew, that would be 6.4%. Well, maybe it did, and maybe it didn't. But as far as the rest of the world is concerned, it really doesn't matter how much China's economy is growing by. What matters for the rest of the world is how much Chinese imports are growing. 
when Chinese imports are growing, as they were for decades, that made China a driver of global economic growth. But last year, China's imports contracted by 17%. So 17% contraction in Chinese imports, that is a hard landing, I would say, by anyone's definition. So the, def the hard landing started in 2015, and it's likely to be very protracted, no matter what the Chinese government does going forward. And this is going to impact everyone around the world. In fact, it already has. Ask, just ask Brazil. Brazil is now suffering the worst depression in 100 years because the commodity prices have crashed due to the lack of Chinese demand for commodities. And that's thrown Brazil, a major commodity producing country, into a depression. So we're already feeling the consequences of this hard landing in China. And the longer it goes on, the more serious the consequences could become. And they're beginning to become not only economic consequences, but increasingly political consequences. All around the world, we're seeing a rapid, rapidly growing backlash against free trade. And the rise of strange political candidates on both the right and the left. Both Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders are anti-free trade, and it's, they have a lot of supporters who fully understand that position and support it entirely. So there's a growing risk that the longer China's economy is in its current state struggling, the greater the risk that we will have a political backlash against free trade, trade barriers could go up. In that case, that makes the chances of a, of a global, we're already in, we already have a global recession. The chances of global depression will increase if we have a backlash against free trade and protectionism advances. Now, I think what is likely to happen is that we are going to have a globally coordinated fiscal stimulus program on a very large scale sometime after the next U.S. president takes office in January 2017. Because they're really, at this point, there are, there are no alternatives to drive the global economy. The U.S. credit growth is too weak to drive the U.S. economy. China's economy is effectively in crisis, as is Japan's and Europe's. Monetary policy now has done pretty much all that it can do. The negative consequences of con quantitative easing are, are now almost as great as the positive consequences of quantitative easing. So the added benefit of more quantitative easing is very uncertain. So monetary policy has really run out of potential to drive the global economy. So that means we're going to have to have a very large round of globally coordinated fiscal stimulus. And I think that's what we can expect in 2017. If we don't get that, then the chances are that our global recession will become a global depression, perhaps as soon as 2018. And I think that uh, we were talking earlier, Larry Summers is going around the world, former Treasury Secretary of the United States, proposing exactly that, a globally coordinated fiscal infrastructure spending program, initiative. Um, not just it, it coordinated, but certainly in every country. And we're getting more and more of that uh, visibility, I think. It's a high probability. The Japanese Prime Minister Abe, in Japan uh, at the G7 meeting recently announced very loudly that he thought the current global crisis is as severe as it was at the peak in 2009. And he called for a globally coordinated fiscal stimulus program. And subsequently, he backtracked on hiking the consumption tax, uh, which is would have been fiscal tightening. So really, uh, Germany is the great holdout here. They are reluctant to have more fiscal stimulus. They have a, they they have actually they have a small government budget surplus, which is really the the worst possible thing a government can do in a world in recession, with political tensions growing, and the threat of a severe severely disturbing political outcome 
that threat is growing by the day. And the longer the global economy remains weak, the greater the risk of a very unhappy political outcome will be. Those chances are increasing. I'm getting a sense, Richard, you've seen things go from financial crisis to economic crisis that we're soon going to be facing political crisis because of the fallout, lack of growth of jobs, slowing economy, uh, lack of confidence in government, etc. And I think people like Trump and Sanders and that are just bellwethers of what's to come. We could talk about Marie Le Pen in France, Peppo Pepe in, in, in Italy, uh, Corbyn in the UK. We're seeing this all around the world right now. This, this almost anti-government, anti-establishment, because they just don't believe that the system is working. Am I reading too much into that? Well, certainly anti-establishment. Yes. I th look, the, it seems to me that the Republican Party elite has just lost control of their party. Donald Trump has stolen the Republican Party away from the Republican establishment because the rank and file of the Republican Party uh, have been suffering under the policies advocated by the Republican Party elite. Uh, free trade, uh, free flow of capital around the world, uh, deregulation, and they've not benefited from any of these things. In fact, their standard of living has not increased for decades. Uh, so suddenly, Donald Trump has pointed this out to them, and they have all defected to him. And he, his policies are really, in many sense, in many ways, the complete opposite of what the Republican establishment has advocated and, and pushed forward for decades. And to be fair, this, much the same can be said about the Democrat Party. After all, it was Bill Clinton who passed NAFTA. And uh, Ross Perot, Remember in the eternal words of Ross Perot. Giant, giant sucking sound. <laughs> giant sucking sound that would cause wages to fall in the U.S. and unemployment to rise and be a blow to the American middle class. And that's certainly been the case. And so that's why Bernie Sanders is, is so popular. So the elite within the Democrat Party, are they're hanging on by their fingernails. So what we're seeing is a backlash against free trade. Now, the problem is, I mean, I can certainly sympathize with all of those people who are opposed to free trade. They have good reason to be. But if we put up trade barriers and the global economy begins contracting, that's only going to make all of our problems worse. So rather than going for protectionism, what we need to do is find policies that will make the demand of other countries grow rather than causing U.S. demand for global products to shrink. So we need to be more imaginative. In my first book, The Dollar Crisis, which was published in 2003, I, you could see that there was a big U.S. housing bubble. It was going to pop. It didn't take too much imagination to see what would happen to the global economy. When it did pop, there'd be much less global demand and a severe global recession. And we would need new sources of aggregate demand if we were going to ever be able to grow out of the crisis. So one of the chapters in that book was called a Global Minimum Wage, in which I advocated pushing up wages in the manufacturing industries of all the countries around the world. If we could just push up wages, right now the, the going wage rate in the manufacturing industry globally is probably something like $8 a day. And there are hundreds of millions of people in the world who would be glad to work for $5 a day. Right, if we're going to make the global economy grow, we need those wages to go up, not go down as they have been doing. So just as in the Western countries, we've had minimum wages now for a century in many places around in the Western developed economies. We now have a global economy. We need to find a way to make the wages in the manufacturing sector go up instead of going down. So if we could reach a global accord to boost the wages in the manufacturing industry by just $1 a day per year, so that next year they go to $9 a day, the year after that they go to $10 a day, the year after that 11 and then 12 and then 13, within a decade or so they would double or triple. And that would increase the purchasing power of the people at the bottom of the pyramid globally so they could buy more things. The Chinese factory workers could buy more goods rather than less goods. So that would be a way to make the global economy grow. 
rather than resorting to 1930s style tariffs resulting in a global depression. So we need to find a way to make the global economy grow by creating more aggregate demand rather than allowing the global economy to implode through greater protectionism. But we have headwinds of robotics and automation, black factories, etc., which is incredible headwinds for this to, to drive up the labor costs uh, as, as more and more automation is happening in the existing manufacturing facilities. So moving something to get take advantage of labor is not there the same as it was before. So driving up those labor costs is going to be a difficult process. Well, we're not talking about raising the wages in these countries to $15 an hour. We're just talking about raising them to $15 a day. And ro robots are not going to be competitive at $15 a day for a long time to come. At 0% interest rates, they could be very competitive in terms of investment. <laughs> no, you're absolutely right. It's all relative, uh, Richard. I, I could just say it's a, it's a heck of a problem. But we just have a lack of demand, and we have massive population, and we have labor arbitrage. And to get this in any kind of coordinated fashion, our governments have never been really good, even within a sovereign country, of, of getting good policy, ever mind having it coordinated. Um, it, it'll almost take a crisis to become coordinated, won't it? Well, so yes, yeah, so you're right. I mean, uh, so therefore the U.S. could impose this unilaterally. It would be nice if we could all reach a deal to raise the wages, but that's probably not going to happen. There would be cheating. So the way that this could be done would be for the U.S. Treasury Secretary to go on television and say, if you cannot prove that your manufacturing workers are paid $9 a day, then we're going to put a 10% tariff on your goods. And then uh, wages would go to $9 a day. And the next year they would go to $10 a day. And then if there were no cheating, the other countries would have no incentive to cheat because after all, they want their workers to have a higher income. And they want the global economy to grow. So the U.S. could enforce a higher global wage rate uh, unilaterally since it is the buyer of first and last resort when it comes to imports from the rest of the world. So Donald Trump says he's a great negotiator. If uh, this is the kind of deal he needs to negotiate, not putting up trade tariffs, but making our trading partners pay their workers more so they can buy more American goods. That way we will all benefit. Richard, we're way past our deadline, but I, you're, I, I just enjoy talking to you so much, and you have so many just absolutely great in, insights. Some of them, I'm sure, will be controversial with many many viewers, but but I uh, I know how well, deeply you think these things through and the, and the logic behind it. We need a break. Can you tell our listeners how they can subscribe to Macro Watch? And I know you have a special offer, too. Right. So, yes, well, first of all, I would ask that they visit my website, richardduncaneconomics.com, and at the very least, sign up to get my free blog. Uh, MacroWatch is based around the ideas that in this new world of fiat money, credit growth drives economic growth. Liquidity determines which way asset prices move. And like it or not, the government does everything within its power to make sure that credit growth and liquidity expand so that the global economy doesn't collapse. And those are the things, the main themes that I monitor in, in MacroWatch. So if your listeners, viewers, will visit my website and click on the orange subscribe button, if they use the discount code FLOWS, then they will have a 55% discount. They can subscribe for $225 a year instead of the normal price of $500 per year. And with that, they will have immediate access to the MacroWatch archives with 25 hours of video available to watch immediately, plus a new video every two weeks or so on breaking news and breaking developments in the global economy. Each video is about 20 minutes long and usually contains around 40 downloadable charts and slides. So I hope they'll check it out. And as I said at the beginning, anybody who's serious about understanding macro events, you can't do it without a subscription to Macro Watch and, and really getting these in, these uh, these insights. Richard, always a pleasure, and we'll talk to you again. Thank you, Gordon. Great speaking with you. Thank you. Bye bye.